Before we leave section 1.2 behind, we want to explore just a little bit more in depth the difference between an observational study and design experiment, because that difference matters. It's actually quite important to us, and it's quite important to science and research. Now, randomized experiments are preferred over observational studies because they have randomization. And randomization is nothing to slouch at, right? Having randomization allows for more control by the researcher. And I mean that in terms of the researcher being able to manipulate things, being able to control for variables like lurking variables, confounding variables, and so on. If it's well designed, it can show a causal link. Now, a link means things are connected causal means cause and effect. So when I say a causal link, what I mean there is cause effect, which is the gold standard. I mean, I would like to show that this drug lowers hypertension, right? Well, you can only get that kind of statement from a randomized experiment. Now, what does it have against it? Why don't we just do these all the time? Well, because they're crazy time expensive, time consuming and expensive. <laughs> um, they're hella expensive, <laughs> I believe the words that um, researchers would use. So um, they can have confounding issues. Just because they are experiments doesn't mean that confounding cannot um, will not be there because confounding can still exist. Um, it's also not always possible. So for example, I mean, let's just think about the syphilis study. You cannot randomly assign syphilis to people. Like, I'm going to randomly give you syphilis. <laughs> well, not ethically, let's put it that way. Um, so for example, ethics. <laughs> Although again, there are cases of the US government randomly giving, um, I believe it was gonorrhea to people in um, a South American country. I can search for the podcast if you're interested to know more about that. Right? So ethics, ethics, you cannot always randomly assign people. So for example, cannot randomly assign smoking, cannot randomly assign, um, randomly assign the treatment ethically. You cannot randomly assign them syphilis. You cannot randomly assign them any disease. That would be unethical, except for sometimes they will do experiments with like colds because they know people will get over it. So they'll give people colds. Um, they have done experiments with that, but pretty much a disease that's much more dangerous than the common cold, they would not do because of ethics. Having to have them would be helpful. Now, an observational study are cheaper, they're easier. Um, you can gather from existing data sets, which is lovely. So that means that everything's nice, right? So you can just go scrape some data off of a website and or off of a government website and gather information. Um, it can provide valuable insight. So don't think just because they're cheaper and easier that they're not providing valuable insight because they do. Observational studies are done all the time, not only because they're cheaper and easier, because we gain value from that. We can explore associations, but not cause and effect, right? That we cannot do. So you cannot claim causation. Causation can only be claimed with an experiment. So you can only claim association due to lurking variables. And being real with you, a lot of times they can't claim causal links even in an experiment because of confounding, right? So, but experiment gets you closer, right? If it's a well-designed experiment, then maybe you can get that, that lovely, lovely cause and effect. But an observational study, you will never, never be able to claim causation, right? A causal link can never happen, right? This is why your science teachers always tell you correlation is not causation. Just seeing an association, that's correlation. Seeing that relationship does not mean that one thing caused the other, right? Due to lurking variables. So this is what your science teacher is talking about and it matters for us as well. So that's the problem with an observational study is that you never can get causation. You can only get correlation. Now that said, a lot of times, you know, design experiments are nice, but there's a lot of times that they're not possible. So for example, smoking, right? One of the reasons that um, smoking was allowed in public for so long, which speaking of which, what we're about to look at is that it's 
unethical basically to say like you, I'm going to make you smoke a pack a day for the next 10 years randomly, right? So it's not always possible due to ethics. Right? So you can't ethically give people the treatment. So a design experiment would be nice, but it's not possible. So then all you've got to rely on is observational studies. And that's what the smoking um, cigarette companies hid behind. They would get in front of Congress and say, well, we don't know because all we have is association. And that's true. However, there was a bit more going on. They kind of did know, but that's a whole other discussion for another time. Speaking of which, let's look at the effect of smoking on lung capacity. So let's look at this example. So in study number one, you find 100 women that are age 20 who do not currently smoke. You randomly assign 50 of the 100 women to a smoking treatment and the other 50 to the no smoking treatment. And you make them do it for 10 years. <laughs> so, so those in the one group um, smoke a pack a day for 10 years, while those in the other group remain smoke free for 10 years. I know this is unethical. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, you measure the lung capacity for each of the 100 women after 10 years, and then you analyze, interpret, and draw conclusions. In study number two, you find 100 women that are age 30, of which 50 have been smoking a pack a day for 10 years, while the other 50 have been smoking for 10 years, have been smoke-free for 10 years. You measure the lung capacity for each of the 100 women, and then you analyze, interpret, and draw conclusions. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this you starting them at age 20, forcing them to smoke or not smoke, and then measuring them after 10 years. This is, hey, these 100 women have already been smoking because they're age 30. So they've been smoking for the last 10 years or not smoking for the last 10 years, and you analyze their lung capacity. All right, well, the response variable is rather obviously lung capacity, right? Because lung capacity is the outcome. The predictor of that lung capacity would be smoking. Right. Now, number one is an observational or design experiment. Oh, okay, so study number one is an experiment because they randomly assigned smokers. So study number one is a designed experiment. Because the researchers randomly assigned smoking. For 10 years. Oh, it's crazy unethical. It, it did not really happen. This is not a real thing. <laughs> At least that I know of. All right, now what about study number two? Study number two was an observational study. And it's retrospective, right? Because they're saying, hey, have you been smoking for the last 10 years? If so, you know, tell us, you know, let us breathe into this tube and tell, find, so we can find your lung capacity. So that would be a case control study. All right, so number two, study number two is observational because they're just seeing who already was smoking but it's retrospective, right? It's looking into their past, right? So you're telling them to look back in time over the last 10 years that they've been smoking. So it is a case control study. Although it does get their lung capacity only at that moment in time. So one could make an argument for cross-sectional, but I'm going to argue it's case control because it's asking them to reflect back on their 10 years of smoking, right? And make that, that's legit that, oh yeah, I've been smoking for the last 10 years and I've been smoking a pack a day for the last 10 years. So that's past looking back. Now, which study would allow a causal link? Causal, cause effect, causation. That's what that's, right? Cause is in there. So if you see this, that piece right there is talking about causation, cause effect, or causation. You'll see all of these kind of terms. They all mean the same thing. And the answer to that is study number one, right? Study number one, because study number one is an experiment. Cause and effect can only come out of experiments.
All right. So what would be the advantages of using a design experiment? Well, it wouldn't allow the cigarette companies to hide so much, right? So the we would be able to argue a causal link between, or I can say a cause effect between smoking and, and lung capacity. Again, the smoking companies wouldn't be able to say, well, our smoking doesn't affect lung capacity because we would be able to argue that cause and effect. That's the big advantage of a design experiment. Right? It has that randomization. Right? So we can also mention that. Also has randomization to help avoid bias. All right, now what about some lurking variables in study two? So when you think about this, you want something that would affect both their smoking and their lung capacity, right? You're looking for a variable, hopefully, that affects both of those because this is the X and this is the Y. So you want some other variable or variables that would have an effect on both of those things. Well, genetics, right? Genetics would be a good one. <laughs> so maybe you're genetically predisposed to being addicted to smoking and you genetically are disposed to having a small lung capacity. Um, this affects lung capacity less, but socioeconomic status is a big one for smoking, right? Socioeconomic status, culture, exercise level, that's a big one. That would be a big one in this because that would affect both of them. Genetics and exercise maybe would affect both of them. These two would really only affect X maybe, but that doesn't mean that they're not valid, right? It means that they're, they're lurking variables that are affecting really only one of them. So that's a little bit more dicey. So I, I guess exercise, exercise would be huge because that would affect whether you're smoking or not or lung capacity, right? Maybe the people that don't exercise are naturally the people that smoke, right? And those people that don't exercise have smaller lung capacity, right? So that would be a really good one. But the other ones could be argued as well. All right, what are the advantages of an observational study? Well, I guess we could get into the difference between um, the design experiment and the observational study because the observational study is not unethical, right? So the design experiment is unethical. It's unethical to force people to smoke. <laughs> you, you're going to random, you know, I randomly choose you to smoke a pack a day for 10 years. I would want no part of that study. So the design experiment is crazy unethical. <laughs> so the advantage to the observational study is that it is not that. So let me just mention, randomly assign a pack a day smoking habit. <laughs> well, if you weren't addicted before, I will make you addicted for 10 years. Right? The observational study is not. Right? It's just asking people, hey, have you been smoking for the last 10 years? If so, can we measure your lung capacity? All right, now, why would the purpose of both studies most likely be inferential? Well, because you're trying to establish a link between smoking and lung capacity for all people, not just for these 100 women that were in this study. So uh, I guess I would say the researchers want to establish the link between smoking and lung capacity. One can imagine the more you smoke, the lower your lung capacity is, right? For all people, right? 
they want to infer from the results of this sample, right? They want to infer from the 100 women. to all humans, right? Take that sample and make an inference, sorry, infer, my R got weird, inference to all people. It's not just about those 100 women, it's about the whole group. Because otherwise, what's the point of having either the, the experiment or the study?